Global Alliance works across continents to shape the future of our profession. Health practitioners deal with the main challenges they face in their organizations and demonstrates the value and positive impact of communications. To further advance this mission, we have the pleasure today in launching the Global Alliance PR and Communication Model. Developed in partnership with Corporate Excellence, Center for Reputation Leadership, the model defines the roadmap and building blocks of the functions of PR and communications that contribute to the creation of differentiation, reputation, trust, and social legitimacy. This model has been built with the collaborative and participatory efforts of a network of over 1,400 professionals across five continents. The model consolidates Global Alliance's 2010 Stockholm Accords and the 2012 Melbourne Mandate and integrates Global Alliance's Global Capabilities Framework, developed in partnership with Huddersfield University. The model enables organizations and professions worldwide to improve their leadership and business decision-making process, while promoting a real and authentic connection with their stakeholders for a post-COVID-19 world. Welcome to the Global Alliance Public Relations and Communication Model. First of all, thank you, Justin, for your presentation and for your continued support during this project. And I would like also to welcome everybody to our offices in Madrid. We are broadcasting from Corporate Excellence Center for Reputation Leadership. So let me tell you a little bit about us, who we are. We are a nonprofit corporate think tank May I say, an accelerator of innovation, research, applied knowledge, and training specialized in intangible assets. This is a platform born 18 years ago, created and financed by large corporations in Spain and Latin, and Latin America. These 23 organizations belong to 10 industries. We employ 1,500,000 people around the world. We serve more than 300 million customers and we are present in uh, more than 100 countries. This is the, a, uh, let's say, the description, the formal description of who we are. But together with this, I would like to mention how we work here. Basically, it is a, a platform of innovation where those large corporations, together with the directors and the executives working and uh, in charge of uh, the intangibles around uh, 700 people working together with uh, academics, universities, business schools, and consultancy firms all around the world. This is the platform where we started our collaboration with uh, uh, Global Alliance to build this roadmap. And the roadmap is uh, based on the, the challenges and opportunities that all organizations are facing around the world, which means basically the need to build and maintain a legitimacy and trust to increase uh, companies and organizations' reputation, as well as building a strong competitive uh, brand positioning able to differentiate our companies in the long run. And finally, creating a strong 
and strategic alignment with all our stakeholders, which means that the new model we are presenting today is a response to those challenge and uh, also a way of demonstrating the huge opportunity for professionals in the PR and communication arena to be the leaders in uh, precisely building uh, the proper answer to those challenges. As Justin mentioned already, it's been a two years project. And this project is building on uh, the Melbourne mandate, also integrating the uh, knowledge and the resources and the toolkit provided the by the Global Capabilities Framework. And finally, building on those two, we are presenting now the Global PR and Communication Model 2021. How it has been done? It's four steps. The first one is, a, let's say, a traditional approach of any research, which is uh, basically the uh, revision of all academic and uh, practitioners' background and uh, past knowledge. The second part is, is unique for us because what we have done, we call that the expert validation is building on the 18 years of experience here at Corporate Excellence with uh, the accumulation of knowledge, best practices, and also learnings and failures from uh, companies all around the world in managing those intangibles. The third step has been uh, achieved thanks to the Global Alliance Network because we were able to have a, a very rich conversation all around the world with uh, 1,400 members of the different associations of the Global Alliance and with professionals, which uh, gave us the possibility to contrast and to validate the expert validation that we have already done during those years. The fourth step of our methodology is uh, applying the most advanced statistical techniques and mathematical models to the results of the survey. We did that because we needed to discover the latent relationships between uh, the four building blocks of the model and then being able to assess the practitioners which the key decisions that they may take in order to be included uh, in the, the most uh, important decision making of uh, the company. Hi, I'm going to tell you a story, but don't worry. It's neither long nor ends badly. It has, like the best stories, a beginning full of doubts and an ending full of certainties. This story began in Nestor Com in 2010. There, the members of the Global Alliance for Population Communication Management signed an agreement that was communicated as the Stockholm Accords. The Accords define the characteristics of the communicative organization and the value of power relation and communication professionals in management, governance, sustainability, and internal and external communication. Two years later, in November 2012, the Global Alliance members were provided with a new guide to build and sustain a strong relationships between an organization and its publics, and in doing so, contribute to society. That guy was named as the Melbourne Mandate because it was approved by the attendees of the World Power Relations Forum hosted by the Australian city. According to that document, the Melbourne Mandate, public relations and communication professionals 
had a mandate to define and maintain an organization's character and values. Second, build a culture of listening and engagement. And thirdly, instill responsible behaviors by individuals and organizations. Really, the model released was very, very advanced. It pushed a change the way PR professionals understood their function, to be more strategic, to consolidate a multi-stakeholder approach, and to be more concerned and involved in societal issues. It was a clear call for the PR community to lead the conversations between companies and their environment. A great opportunity to play a main, a main role in the organizations instead being mere weaknesses. Next chapter of this story was written in January 2017 in London. There was a debate inside the board of the Global Alliance about updating the Melbourne mandate. Some, a minority, had a conservative vision. Other, the majority, thought we had to develop new references to serve our mission, that is, I remember the mission of the Global Alliance, to unify the power relation profession, to raise professional standards all over the world, to share knowledge for the benefit of, of its members and to be the global voice for power relations in the public interest. Those two nights in London, I couldn't sleep a minute. The controversy affected me a lot. I had many doubts about the path of the organization I was chairing at that moment. Finally, the fresh suspicion won the discussion and the board of the Global Alliance decided to update the Melbourne mandate, but lighting up a new model. London was really a turning point for the GA. A new vision was born to build a more inclusive organization, closer to the members, more humble and open, a truly global alliance. The new model shows clearly that spirit. Almost three years after, we are here in Madrid, introducing the new global PR and communication model. As Angela Yoza is going to explain deeper the model later, I'm going to share with you three learnings of our story. The first learning is that our profession is more affected than others by the deep changes the world is experiencing. The main challenge of digitalization is cultural change, which needs a strong effort in communication. The main challenge of climate change is to convince people that we have to modify our lifestyle, which needs, again, a strong effort in communication. The main economic change is to create a world of opportunity for all, where poverty is not accepted, which needs, again, a strong effort in communication to build a more human capitalism. The main challenge for organizations is to find a fair balance between stakeholders, which needs, again, a strong effort in communication to manage these all conversations. And finally, the main ethical challenge is to take care of the truth as a human law to protect the honesty of any kind of relationships. The second learning is that we have to be brave and proactive to address these challenges as a profession. Our profession is in a crossroad, and this model, the global PR and communication model, is a beacon to show what is the best way to elevate our function. That means also to elevate our responsibility to convert the intangible assets into a better tangible world. And the third learning is that theoretical models come to reality when beliefs guide professional performance. So this story, already a chapter in the history of the Global Alliance, never ends. PR professionals, it's time to step up 
be brave and jump to an upper level. Let's go up together. Hello friends, communication is on top of the leader's agenda. And let me congratulate Global Alliance for the presentation of this global PR and communication model and for the chance to take part in this presentation and to support a new standard for our profession. This model aims to help professionals navigate this new normal with the necessary knowledge and tools to manage intangible assets, demonstrating how the role contributes to the creation and protection of corporate value. The model enhances three key aspects of the communicative organization. First, defining organizational character and values. Second, building a culture of listening and engagement. And third, the fulfillment of responsibility in all its dimensions. These key aspects are part of what we also promote at our company. At LLYC, we want to improve the world around us and we firmly believe that honest, intelligent, innovative and efficient communication fosters confidence and understanding among people, companies and institutions. In this way, we contribute to solving many of the challenges of our times. This crisis is a speeding up change. It is confirming the need to have a defined corporate purpose to come out of this stronger. And communication is key, it is essential. It has become a fundamental asset for success at such a complicated time. We must respond to the challenges ahead of us. In a society that calls for greater commitment, we need facts. We need to evolve from saying to doing. The how is also extremely important because it connects to the emotional side of business. The model that Global Alliance proposes clearly responds to this context. It is a strong, sound model will with the contribution of many different professionals around the world. We proudly support its presentation and dissemination. And not just that, we will put this into practice in the many different projects we address with our clients. We believe in this model that defines the roadmap and support the functions of PR and communication as a contribution to create differentiation, reputation, trust, and social legitimacy, a new way to do business. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose Manuel Velasco, and thank you, Jose Antonio Llorente, for highlighting the relevance of uh, the model. And special thanks to YIC for supporting the project. Now, what we are going to do is what we all are expecting. We're going to talk about the building blocks of the global PR and communication model. I'm going to share this part with uh, Clara Fontan, Director of Intelligence and Knowledge. She played a, a fundamental role in developing the model. And what we are going to do is that, uh, basically, I'm going to start describing the concept. Clara is going to give us key findings of uh, each one of the building blocks. And then I will come back and uh, tell you more specifically, what are the role and the, uh, the toolkit that we are providing you as professional and PR communications to be able to implement each one of the building blocks at home. The model. Let's talk about why, how, and what. Why? This model has uh, its deep reason why in answering the uh, four challenges and opportunities that all organizations ag around the world had. Those challenges relate to the need of building a long-standing differentiation, the need of uh, building and reinforcing the social and relationship capital 
we call this engagement with all our stakeholders. The idea of uh, generating advocacy, basically activating our key ambassadors who are going to talk about us, who are going to recommend our products and services and protect us uh, during crisis and uh, uh, key moments of the organization. And finally, last but not least, all organizations need to build or rebuild trust and social legiti legitimacy to get and enlarge our license to operate. This is the reason why. How is by uh, building on, if I may repeat the concept, building on the building blocks, the, the five building blocks. Starting with corporate purpose, which is uh, the first step of the model. It is the core of the model, and it is uh, the one who affects and helps the rest of the four building, building blocks. The second one is uh, brand and culture. Brand and culture addresses the need of reaching a long-standing differentiation. Then we have uh, reputation and reputational risks. Here, what we have is the, the tools that we can use to build trust, social legitimacy, and uh, as I said, basically getting our license to operate. We have two other building blocks. They are transversal uh, key conditions to make it happen. One of them, and probably the most important one, is communications. You see that communications is a round circle here in, uh, in blue color. Without communications, nothing would exist. Communications is building realities. That's the reason why it is uh, uh, circulating permanently and in a dynamic form, the model. And finally, the, uh, the last building block is a permanent and transversal activity of listening, of helping companies being connected with the expectations of uh, their stakeholders on a permanent and continuous basis to be able to match what we do with all these uh, expectations, dynamic expectations, and uh, demanding expect expectations that help us in becoming an excellent organization. This model is the result of these two years of global consensus research. This is our model. Let's start with the heart of the model, purpose. Purpose is the reason why. It's born in the identity of the organization, looking back to the identity and projecting this identity to the future. But it is not an, a statement. It is a transformational tool. Stating the purpose is not enough. The key thing is understanding that purpose is guiding strategic decisions, capital allocation, the way we build our relationships with the rest of uh, the stakeholders. And uh, in fact, it is in the center of the model because uh, purpose is expressed through the brand and culture, purpose is the basis for reputation and mitigation of uh, reputational risks. Purpose exists thanks to the, the communications activities and uh, purpose requires a continuous 
measurement of the achievement thanks to the implementation or of purpose. As I said, purpose is not an statement. First purpose is a continuous process of implementation and expression. And now I would like to pass the word to Clara so and see how uh, we build on purpose. What we are going to do is like try to um, share with you the key findings that we have discovered about this building block. As, uh, as Angel was saying, purpose uh, should be understood as a fundamental basis of a strategy and the framework for guiding the decision-making process that guarantees consistency, integrity, and coherence. And what we see uh, according to the data is like there is a relevance, uh, there is a, a global consensus about the relevance of the corporate purpose and most of the um, respondents uh, agree with this idea. And, and they have said that they have told us that it has gained credibility over the last three years. But one of the main findings related to purpose is um, uh, the significant impact on all dimensions of the model, corporate brand and culture, reputation and communication. So we have discovered that if we um, develop, a uh, define a strong corporate purpose, then the impact on intangible assets will be greater in terms of efficiency and effectiveness. But also, uh, it's highlighting that the method that we use for defining purpose is key and plays a key role in all the intangible assets and all the pillars of this model. So it means that if we follow a 360 degree process, uh, taking into account the expectations and demand of all our stakeholders, then the impact on intangible asset and all the building blocks of this model will be greater than if we follow a top-down traditional process. Even knowing that, what we see is like most of the organizations followed, uh, are following um, classical process or traditional process, and they are promoting top-down um, uh, strategies from senior manage manager to basic employees, and also adapting traditional concepts as mission or vision, more than focus on this kind of participatory process. Um, all in all, we see that organizations are trying to, 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 to advance in this, uh, in this area, and most of them has already defined its corporate purpose. But the thing is that uh, only half have activated and implemented it through the organization. So there is a great opportunity to work on this because we are seeing that if you activate the purpose through the organization, then the impact on all the building blocks will be greater. Um, also, we wanted to highlight, because there are a lot of data in the full report, but here, uh, related to purpose, we wanted to highlight that a participatory method focus on taking into account employees, uh, also opinion leaders, uh, sta external stakeholders, more than focus on the vision of senior managers. So here we can see all the aspects that we should take into account if we want to build a strong corporate purpose following a participatory process. Um, related to who is leading the definition and implementation and activation of purpose in organization, what we see is like it's mainly led by the chief executive officer. But the second position is in charge of PR and communication uh, practitioners. So we, we see that this is an opportunity because when we ask them, they say that they should lead. Uh, so this is something that we should try to achieve because the impact on intangible assets will be greater, as we were saying, but, uh, but also we have discovered that this is an opportunity to participate in the making decision process and have a seat in the senior table. So just for, just for concluding, oh sorry, I, yeah, I'm here, yeah. So now what we are going to do is trying to know what are the tasks or the toolkit that we should uh, develop in this uh, role or in this phase. So Angel is going to tell us. Thank you, Clara. Well, I have to, to mention that uh, what we have found in the uh, research is, uh, is key. And it validates all the years of experience in defining act 
activating purpose in organizations. First of all, it has to do with this idea of uh, who is leading, who is helping the implementation of the purpose in the organization. Because as we have seen, top-down methodologies, uh, even if they are the most commonly used, are not the ones who ensure the potential of purpose. Because purpose is there to promote uh, attitudes and behaviors from all our uh, stakeholders. So it's very easy. You don't have to define your purpose for your stakeholders. Rather than doing that, you have to define it with them because you want and you wish to join the organization, share a building belief uh, uh, environment, activating uh, supportive behaviors from your employees, your customers, your shareholders, investors, regulators, and society at large. So it is key for the PR and communication professional to be the specialist, the one who knows about the methodology. And we have seen very clearly that uh, using participatory methodologies, expert technologies and expert methodologies is the key to ensure that uh, we would get the real feedback and the real uh, payback, if, <laughs> if I may say, from purpose. The second role, which is crucial for the PR and communication professional is to take care of corporate purpose. Once it is defined, it would be there for a number of years. And also, uh, we will require to continue with the implementation process also for a number of years. So the specialist, the one who's going to create, to take care of corporate purpose is basically the uh, PR and communication professional helping the CEO in this uh, very technical task. That's why we linked this idea of uh, managing, defining, activating purpose and being the creator of corporate purpose with uh, the global capabilities framework. And uh, we added a checklist highlighting of the 11 capabilities, which ones are closely related to purpose and which ones are a need for you in terms of training and capability to be able to fulfill this crucial role regarding purpose. Now let's start with building block two. It's brand and corporate culture. The way we can uh, implement and bring to life the purpose of an organization is uh, through our corporate brand and culture. And why? Basically because uh, the corporate brand is the experiences that we deliver in each one of the touch points that we have with all our stakeholders. And we are adding the power of brand and culture because one of the key touch points, if I may say, is precisely our employees. So the idea is uh, being sure that we can align and make it coherent and consistent each one of our touch points to be able to fully express the carpet purpose. And in terms of culture, the values and the principles who are guiding the behavior and the attitudes over the company and its employees is basically the expression of the corporate purpose, is the way we make it happen by living the purpose through our corporate values and principles. So now 
we are going to, to see some key data related to the research. And what we see re related to corporate brand is uh, that most of the organization feel prepared to manage, but even knowing that, there is a long way to, to improve the management of a brand, a corporate brand. And there is a lot of data related to how to do that, but today here what we wanted to highlight is that employee engagement is one of the key elements for strengthening the corporate brand, as Angel was saying. And when we ask practitioners, PR and communication practitioners about that, they mentioned that understanding the role of employees as the main brand ambassadors and reputation ambassador is key because they will be creating experiences through all the stakeholders and all the touch points. So this is why here we see that we should focus on employees and em em uh, engagement with them if we want to strengthen our corporate brand. Related to, to, to who is leading this area inside of the organization, what we see is like the corporate brand manager reports mainly to the CEO, to the, to the chief executive officer, but in a second way to the corporate communication director. So it means that the corporate communication function is uh, over or is gaining importance in managing corporate brand. And we see that they are always involved in the management of corporate brands, sometimes with a participatory roles and sometimes with a leadership role. And we should try to, to, to promote uh, the, the leadership role inside of the organization related to corporate brand. And related to culture, what we see is like the degree of readiness to manage corporate culture is high moderate, but again, there is a, a lot of element to, to, to improve the management of corporate culture. And, and what we see here is like chief executive officer and human resources area are the most important one when we talk about who is leading corporate culture inside of the organization. But the third one related to the data is for corporate communication. And we should try to, to, to involve in this area because we are seeing that employees and culture is a key element if we want to, to have a good impact or, uh, in all these pillars that we are presenting today, but also achieving the business outcomes that Angel was mentioning in, in the beginning. And, and here, what we wanted to highlight today is like, if we want to, to internalize the culture inside of the organization and promote a shared belief system, what we should do is like, focus on the recruitment process. And we are seeing that if we hire people aligned with our purpose and values, then the, the, the alignment with the organization will be better and they will feel identified with the organization, the corporate brand, and they will, uh, they will be developing behaviors and attitude aligned with the purpose and having, uh, ha and having a positive impact on all the touch points that Angel was mentioning. So this is why this is a key aspect if we want to work on, cult on culture. And the second element is related to um, develop uh, incentive awards and process related to values and purpose to create alignment inside of the organization. So, now, what we are going to explain to you is what should be the role of PR and communication management in this phase, and Angel is going to help us. Thank you, Clara. Yes, I, I would like to remind that uh, any company can be copied regarding its offer, products and services, but no one would be able to copy its culture the way it manages its corporate brand in each touch point. That's why this building block number two is directly related with this idea of building a differentiation which is going to last. And that's the reason why, in terms of uh, the key functions to be uh, achieved by the corporate communication uh, professionals, we strongly believe that uh, the comprehensive management of the corporate brand is uh, a key one. And uh, the second one is, as Clara has said, when uh, asking our interviewees about who is leading corporate culture, a few years ago, 
no doubt it would be only the CEO and the area of human resources. But nowadays we see clearly the communication function having more and more importance because, uh, as I said before, corporate culture and values are the way in which we can bring to life the purpose of the organization. And communication plays a key role in this process of aligning stakeholders, starting inside out with our employees and then with the rest of our stakeholders. As we have done in the previous building block, we are extremely interested in uh, bridging the results of this model and uh, the global capabilities framework. Because uh, the key thing is helping practitioners to be able to be in command of the corporate brand and also the culture. And in order to do this, we have the information that we need to see in which uh, capabilities we need to work on to be able to uh, reach an excellent uh, management of both the corporate brand and, uh, and culture. Lara, now it's building block number three, corporate reputation and reputational risks. Here again, I'm coming back to the other two. We started with purpose. We bring to life and we implement purpose through each touch point and the behavior of our employees and also the, the corporate behavior. But then what we have is our stakeholders looking at us, judging what we do, what we say. And that's reputation. And reputation is, is a key component to be able to uh, evaluate what we do with uh, the reality that counts. The reality that counts is precisely the perceptions of our stakeholders. That's why reputation and reputational risk is uh, a key component of uh, our model. Clara. So now we are going to highlight key findings related to this building block. And what we see is like um, organization around the world uh, feel modestly prepared to manage corporate reputation. So it's a long, uh, a long uh, way, or there is a long way to, or to improve in this, in this area. And even there are some regions, regions that need to, to focus on it if they want to, to improve and to, to manage reputation in an efficient way. And, but the thing is that why this is the this third building block? And as Angel was saying, uh, it's really important to, to know what, what your stakeholder think about you but also what we see is like, this is one of the most important topic for PR and communication professional. So they are saying that increasing corporate reputation, also building trust and social legitimacy and ethical practices are the most important topic for the future of the function. So this explains why we have also this building block, to, uh, this building block here. And also, uh, in a second level of importance, we see that they mention digital communication, sustainability, and CSR, and employee engagement. And all of them are inside of this model. So, um, uh, related to the function with leading reputation, what we see is that it's mainly led by corporate communication. So, it uh, promotes or uh, uh, re reinforces the role of PR and communication professional managing reputation. Um, we wanted also to highlight or to see what are the most important dimensions to build a strong corporate reputation. And according to, to, the, to, to our data, to the study, we see that the key aspects for managing reputation are product and services, but, in, in, but also sustainability, uh, CSR, governance, and workplace. So it's, it's, it's uh, helped us to, to know 
which are the most important dimensions and aspects that we should take into account if we were to, to create a strong corporate reputation? Yes, here, if I may say, I would like to highlight something because uh, when we talk about reputation, we talk about enhancing the, uh, the let's say, the uh, reality that we deliver to our stakeholders. Reputation is, is based on the realities. It's based on doing the right things. And uh, most importantly, being sure that uh, the things we do are the most relevant ones to our stakeholders. If we do the right thing, we will deserve reputation because reputation is in the minds of our stakeholders. We don't uh, manage reputation directly. What we have to do is do the right things in order to deserve a strong feeling of uh, trust, admiration, and respect. And that, or those strong feelings, are basically uh, reputation. And when coming back to uh, this chart, it is very relevant for all the PR and communication professionals to see that uh, nearly a half of reputation is explained by corporate issues. So reputation is built uh, working on sustainability and CSR, working on uh, a good governance, ethics, transparency, and the way we deal with our employees. Those three dimensions of uh, reputation explains nearly a half of how we can build reputation. So I, I wanted to, to stress this point because it does explain also why reputation is related to the top level conversations that a uh, communication director can have in the organization because it's related finally with the license to operate. Yeah, the thing is also, Angel, that we are seeing, according to the, the study, that of course sustainability is governance and workplace is playing a key role of, on building the reputation, a strong reputation, but also we are seeing that ethics business or business ethics is gaining in importance. So according to the PR and communication professional, what we are seeing is like all the aspects related to business ethics is gaining in importance. And for example, for them, honesty in communication, transparency or ethical codes are really important if we want to strengthen our reputation. And this is something that we are seeing and it could be like some keys or some tips to, to, to approach this, um, this concept. Also, um, we wanted to say, as uh, Angel was mentioning, that we wanted to, to highlight that reputation um, help you to create business value, but at the same time, it protects value. So this is why reputational risk should be integrated in the enterprise management system. And here, what we see is like there is a long road ahead because half of, uh, half of the organizations analyzed uh, have risk uh, maps, risk scenarios. So uh, we think that we should work really hard on this area if we want to promote a collaboration between reputation or the communication area and also the reputation, the risk department and also to integrate reputational risk inside of the, the organization. So here, when, when we try, there, there, is, there are a lot of data and, and, and information in our full report study, but uh, what we have discovered is like, if we want to work on reputational risk, one of the main strategic tool is related to the code of conduct. So it's uh, also highlight the idea of working on purpose and value, and this is why this is the first building block of this model, because uh, if you strengthen the code of ethic, the, pur the purpose and values, then you will be mitigating or avoiding uh, risk. And we see that there are these two main approaches. There are companies working on that, and they are trying to, to promote a proactive method uh, facing reputational risk, but also there are companies focused on a reactive method. 
and they they react when the crisis happens more than work on purpose, ethical principles and values. So this is something that we wanted to highlight related to how to work on reputational risk mitigation. And now Angel is going to tell us what should be the role of PR and communication management in this phase. Yes, thank you, Clara. <coughs> in fact, both uh, the uh, CEOs and the uh, communication professionals see that uh, reputation is at the top of the uh, priorities within an, organi an organization. Unfortunately, the uh, management of corporate reputation is uh, more and more closely related to the uh, communi corporate communication function. So, which are the specific tasks that uh, uh, the profession can uh, develop in uh, reputation? First of all, if you need, and if we need to be the connectors with uh, society when the, and with uh, spectators, uh, stakeholder expectations, the tool is measuring reputation. Reputation is basically this perception and judgments coming from our stakeholders and we need a, a listening process which enable us to fully understand those, those expectations and embed the expectations in the uh, management in the actions and behavior of our organization. So, so this is the first task, the first uh, task, being the interface between stakeholders and the organization through measurement of uh, reputation. And the second one has to do with protecting value. The idea here is that uh, we need uh, to persuade the the organizations that uh, reputational risk have to be included in the overall map of risks within the organization. And uh, the communication director can play a crucial role being the expert, the one who can help both in identifying those reputational risks and also helping the organizations, the organization in uh, mitigating those risks uh, help in all the areas which are involved in the potential creation of reputational risks, which means basically all the areas within an organization. And linking this with the global capabilities framework, we can see very clearly that uh, uh, there is a a clear path in terms of training to be able to uh, finally get the uh, proactive management of uh, both reputation and reputational risk. Now, Clara, it's building block four, communications. In fact, it is a constant dimension of our model because communications is uh, the way and the uh, mandatory way for an organization to exist and for a purpose, a brand, culture, reputation to exist. That's why communications is all over the place. So now we are going to, to see some, some data related to that. And what we see here is like there is a high level of preparation in all the regions analyzed. Um, um, but the thing is that when we see how PR and communication practitioners are facing the, the goals um, and what they want to achieve through the communication uh, area, what we see is like the main topics are related to trust and legitimacy, differentiation, and improve corporate reputation. So they are trying to work, what we see is like the idea of trying to work on creating a, a strategic communication system to achieve these three objectives. So this is why our model 
uh, try to, to achieve this outcome because all these objectives are related to the outcomes of uh, the PR and communication model. Um, now, Angel is going to tell us what are the main tasks that we should uh, develop in this space. Thank you, Clara. And, and here are corporate communication directors and uh, professionals are really in their uh, ecosystem. <laughs> and I have to remind something related to the previous steps because uh, uh, the most important and uh, strategic component of communication is uh, building a corporate narrative uh, strategy. And uh, the starting point for this uh, communication framework is uh, the purpose. So purpose is guiding, in fact, all communications, all messages for all stakeholders. That, that is why the uh, fundamental uh, tool for a very strong corporate narrative. Taking that platform, then what we have is a second uh, aspect which is uh, more and more important because companies and organizations are becoming content generators. And the generation of content is also been nurtured by the purpose, the brand, or values, so we can now be able to produce this uh, content generation in order to be spread by basically the most important uh, communicators that we have in the organization, which are basically our employees and our customers. They are the ones who are going to spread on a massive way this generation of content that we are going to provide them. And finally, uh, the classic uh, roles of uh, communication uh, function, which is uh, the comprehensive management of all channels, all platforms, and all uh, the, uh, say, uh, consistency and coherence of uh, messages and channels and uh, platforms thinking in all our stakeholders. And here, what the Global Capabilities Framework help us in uh, being sure which are the capabilities that we need to develop and to reinforce uh, to be able to fulfill this important role of the uh, communication as uh, the tool to bring to life the organization. Clara, <laughs> building block number five. It's about uh, connected intelligence and intangible metrics. Again, this one is fundamental. It's probably a, a new requirement for anyone, any organization, who wants to demonstrate that uh, measurement and uh, KPIs in intangibles are absolutely key. Why? We have to accept that other functions within the organization have no problem with this. If you belong to the financial department, you have been provided with uh, measurement KPIs that no one discuss. They are widely accepted for, from international bodies and internally. But now, with us, when dealing with intangibles, we need to run the extra mile because uh, our measurement systems are younger than the financial ones. And we need to, to build on that because it's a crucial point for the future of uh, the profession. As Angel was saying, financial indicators um, show <coughs> the solvency and profitability 
of an organization at any given time. But when we talk about non-financial indicators, we are talking about uh, how to create value in the long term and the health of the company in that moment and how it's going to create value in the future. So what we are going to do now is we are going to highlight key elements about how this, in con this um, kind of metrics uh, are being integrated in organizations. So when we ask professionals about why sh we should measure non-financial indicators, we see the, that according to them, if we do that, then we will be doing, or we will be making better decisions. Also, this is an opportunity if we have all this data for avoiding reputational risk also, it uh, provides the possibility of design engagement strategies and it's aligned with previously, what we have said previously, this idea of know what your stakeholders ex are ex waiting from you or ex the, the expectation to try to connect with them and develop strategies. And the last <laughs> element that we are seeing that is, is important to take into account for measuring is related to, to, to to know the perception and to and to see how social trends are evolving. So there are four main um, combinations of metrics inside of the organization. The most used uh, are related to financial indicators, uh, business KPIs and financial performance. Also, there are some organizations working on, a stake on, on stakeholder satisfaction uh, metrics and they are developing metrics or integrating metrics related to customer satisfaction, work environment. The third level of metrics that we can see in organization are related to uh, intangible and loyalty. So we see net promoter score, reputation, um, uh, also advocacy, index, uh, the, the rate of, of engagement. And the last system that we are seeing is related to online and content analysis. It's important to highlight here that we see that there are organizations using these metrics online just yes, as the unique system for measuring. So um, what we are seeing is like if we want to develop this connected intelligence system, as Angel was explaining, we need to integrate a range of uh, indicators, <laughs> non-financial indicators to complement the traditional view and try to have um, the decision process with better decisions. So uh, also what we are seeing is like the most important stakeholders to be measured are related to employees and customer. So we see that organizations are trying to integrate a uh, uh, monthly and also annual basis method, but also they try to measure other stakeholders, but not as regular as, <coughs> as this one. And, and the last idea, oh sorry, the last idea that we wanted to, to highlight here is like mm, companies are uh, starting to work on, on, on correlating or on, on integrating uh, this intangible asset with uh, financial um, indicators and also financial performance, trying to integrate them inside of the corporate balance scorecard. And with this idea, trying to provide a more holistic vision about the company and trying to help uh, the decision process with better data and information. So Angel is going to tell us what should be the role of peer and communication management function in this space. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Clara. Well, first of all, we need to have in the uh, corporate communication and PR department a group of specialists in, uh, in data and in analysis. We need to be uh, equipped with uh, a very sophisticated team of uh, specialists who can help us in uh, managing and developing this financial link with non-financial metrics and being able to provide uh, the organization with uh, this information for decision taking. So first of all, we need to build this uh, team of specialists within our department. The second one is uh, we don't have to invent the wheel because fortunately we have AMEC. AMEC has been working 
in uh, the last uh, few years in developing a standard way of integrating the evaluation of uh, uh, communication in uh, what they call the integrated evaluation framework. All we need to do is learn from that, use their framework extensively. And the third one is uh, if we need uh, to be the connectors, the interface between stakeholders and uh, the C-suite, we need to run also to undertake uh, trend analysis to be able to uh, give an advanced uh, ident identification of uh, the new trends which are going to bring uh, both uh, risks but more importantly opportunities. So those are the three tasks that we need to undertake as PR and communication uh, directors. So the idea is uh, providing a, a whole picture of uh, who we are, how we are perceived, and what are the decisions that we can take based on this knowledge. And the first one might be the measurement of uh, communication outcomes based on the AMEC framework. The second one is to have uh, continuous tracking to identify social trends and expectations to be able to work in advance. As uh, Clara has said, business and financial indicators are telling us a lot of the past, but we need to bring the future to the uh, C-suite and the way of bringing that future and anticipating uh, opportunities and risk is by monitoring and uh, tracking social trends and expectations. The third one uh, is the idea of measuring and reporting the key non-financial indicators internally to the C-suite and also <coughs> to the executive uh, committee they desperately need information about our reputation, our brand, the alignment of our employees, the, uh, also the perceptions and the way we are being judged by our main stakeholders. So those KPIs are absolutely crucial for decision taking and also for the supervision of the council when uh, judging and evaluating and assessing the performance of the directors of uh, any company. In the fourth step, we need to be able to understand that uh, each touch point of our corporate brand has to be evaluated in its power to change perceptions, not only in terms of ROI or return on investment. The fifth one is uh, being sure that if we have managed to have uh, an authentic large scale advocacy uh, uh, behavior, we need also to be able to uh, to track the uh, return of these advocacy uh, activities. How does it link with uh, the global capabilities framework? In fact, if we take uh, three of the 11 capabilities, they are absolutely and closely related with this idea of uh, being trained, advanced in the use and the design and also the capability to, to learn, to interpret and to uh, give consultancy uh, to the C-suite based on, on data.
the global PR and communication model, its main objective is to provide organizations with uh, the key building blocks to be able to navigate in the uh, intangible economy. And at the same time, companies, organizations need uh, to have in front of the management of the building block, the uh, professional who is going to be able to do these tasks in an excellent way and uh, provide an, a strategic leadership in PR and communications management. Our model is fulfilling these two different tasks, which are absolutely complementary. From one side, the proper answer to organizations and then to professionals highlight the uh, huge opportunity to become the experts, the one who has the knowledge to implement this model within the organization. So, in summary, the excellent management of purpose, brand, culprit culture, reputation, and reputational risk and communications enables organizations to build a lasting differentiation. This role of the PR and communication professional will be able to enable the organizations to achieve engagement, to achieve authentic advocacy, and uh, trust and social legitimacy. So, on one hand, long-lasting differentiation, and on the other hand, the license to operate. So the global PR and communication model demonstrates that there is a direct relationship between the excellent management of the uh, building blocks and as a consequence, being invited as the communication director to participate in the strategic decision-making process. What we have seen is uh, coming back to the heart of the, uh, of the model, the likelihood that the uh, PR and communication director will be or become a member of the C-suite depending directly on uh, the role that this professional plays in defining and activating the, uh, the purpose in a proper way. Because as we said, purpose is uh, most frequently uh, defined by or using a method, a top-down method, which is not the right one, let me say. The right one is uh, building your purpose with your stakeholders and following a clear methodology. When this happens, and when the one who leads the methodology is the PR communication, then there is a direct causal relationship to be part of the C-suite. The second building block is the brand and culture. If we stop a little bit on brand, let's remind that we are all the time referring to corporate brand, not to product brand. Product brand uh, is not the territory for the communication director, while the corporate brand is clearly its uh, territory. And what we have seen is that uh, being the one who leads, the corporate brand the management is also a key component to be uh, part of uh, the C-suite. 
The second component of the uh, second building block is culture. Here we have seen in the results of uh, the research that uh, communication directors are more and more involved in this task. And uh, it is crucial because uh, in this idea of achieving the alignment of internal and external uh, stakeholders, which is an inside out process, this idea of helping the organization in defining the corporate values and principles guiding the uh, attitudes and behavior of the employees and the corporation itself is uh, again a key component for elevating the role of uh, communications to the top of the pyramid uh, being part of uh, social societal conversation with uh, the C-suite. When coming to building block number three, reputation, here we have a, a different situation because what we have seen is that uh, corporate reputation, reputational risks, and corporate culture are fundamental to elevate the role of the communication directors. But when we contrast this finding with the reality, what we see is that uh, those three uh, activities within the uh, communication department are not at the top of the priorities. So we clearly need to advance in those three to elevate them within our own responsibilities and the importance that we uh, give to the three in able to be, as I said before, a key component in the strategic decision taking within the organization. Building block number four is communications. Here, it's our territory. So no doubt that we have to advance, but we have a very strong position here where we can uh, build on that and uh, fully understand and help uh, the organization also fully understand that communications plays a strategic role and uh, basically the reality of the organization, the existence in the minds of all stakeholders of our organization is uh, basically through communication activities. Building block number five, <laughs> metrics and measurement. It is clear now that uh, internally, organizations need to integrate intangible KPIs with business and financial KPIs on the balance scorecard. The balance scorecard basically defines how we understand success in an organization. So we cannot understand the success and uh, sustainability if we don't have reputation, brand, purpose as uh, key indicators to be included in the balance scorecard. But nothing will happen if we don't link them with compensation and rewards policies. And externally, the way we can build on this intangible side of the company, which represent on average 50% of the value of an organization, we have a fantastic framework to report externally. It is the Interna International Integrated Reporting Council which provides us with uh, the framework of the Integrated Reporting uh, which is based on a very clear idea that a company, any company in the world is managing five different capitals. Two of them are tangible, the financial capital and the manufacturing capital. Those two capitals were absolutely important and key until the 90s. 
but there are other four intangible capitals which have been growing constantly. It's about human capital, about uh, relationship and social capital, about innovation capital, and uh, natural capital. Those four have been growing to represent nowadays, as I said, 50% on average of the total value and risk of organizations. And in many sectors, they do represent much more than that. So intangibles have to be internally in the way we understand uh, success and compensation and externally in the way we can uh, attract investment, talent, client, and be uh, seen as a suitable uh, players from the point of view of uh, regulators and society. The global PR and communications model exists thanks to the resources provided by corporate excellence and the hard work of all our, uh, our team. And uh, especially, uh, it has a lot to do with uh, Clara Fontana. Well, it has been a privilege. Uh, of being part of this research team and having the opportunity to share this knowledge with this global community. And the thing is that uh, from here, Angela and I want to give special thanks to all the Global Alliance members and professional and companies whose invaluable contribution have enabled this research and the development of the PR and communication model of the future. And also, we wanted to highlight if you want to know more about all these information and the things that we have been talking today, all the materials, the full report, the secret summary, and, and this video will be available in this site. So please, you can go to, to this site, uh, Angel, please, the prandcomsmodel.com and all the information about the building blocks and about the PR and communication model are available there. So from here, just to say thank you, Yes, and, and please remember that uh, the PR and communications model is not a research, is not just a document that you can read. It's not that. It's a, a practical toolkit for helping you in advancing both in your career as well as helping organizations, companies, and uh, any other institution in really facing the future with uh, optimism and being sure that they can navigate in the e intangible economy. Please, use it. <laughs>